I want people to look ahead and identify important moments in their life, personally, professionally, important situations, triggers, stressors, and instead of reacting, to instead respond, meaning you're more deliberate, you're more intentional, and you've put some forethought. Someone cares about you. There's a reason why your heart is beating. You still have a purpose. Don't give up. It's important to know that you're not alone. You're not alone. You're, you're not, not alone. alone. You are not alone. Daily physical activity such as taking a walk offers numerous benefits for both body and mind. Not only does it improve our physical health, but also helps us relax, manage stress, and enhance our moods. So throw on your shoes and head out for your mile-long walk as we dive into the expertise of combat-tested retired Navy SEAL Master Chief Stephen Drum. He's renowned for co-developing the acclaimed Warrior Toughness Program, a game-changer in how the Navy prepares young sailors and officers for intense combat situations. And since retiring, Stephen helps people unlock their potential. Stephen, welcome to the One Mile, One Veteran podcast. Hey, thanks, Danny. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be with you. Absolutely. As our listeners begin their Strava fitness tracker to log their miles, would you mind sharing what inspired you to join the Navy in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, as a little kid, I was always drawn to the service and I always looked up to Vietnam veterans, primarily, you know, the Army Special Forces. I wanted to be some kind of commando and I just thought that was the most fascinating, coolest job in the world. And by the time I got kind of to high school, I had an uncle he was really influential in my life. He was a naval aviator. And he gave me this book about SEALs in Vietnam. And I read that book. And I learned more about, you know, the special operations forces in the Navy, the Navy SEALs. And I decided, you know, that's something that I really want to try. That's something that because the one thing I liked about that is unlike the Army Special Forces at the time, you could go through boot camp and you could go right to SEAL training. Not how it worked out for me, but in theory, that's how it worked. So that's kind of the reason why I decided to do that. And I just kind of thought it was kind of cool that the Navy had something like that. So I don't know. Without a couple of reasons, I just decided I was going to commit to that and join the Navy right out of high school at age 18. Well, let's let's talk about the fact that you didn't qualify out of boot camp for the SEALs. I mean, that's definitely a, a big discouragement because from what I read is your recruiter, like a lot of us, convinces us, hey, once you get in, you can get a waiver for just about everything. But when the reality actually sets in, it's like, well, you had to put in a little bit more work. So how did that kind of affect your motivation and still becoming a SEAL? Yeah, so the background is is that I'm really, really bad at math. I mean, I still am. And I always joke, the closest I got kicked out of to SEAL training was actually on the dive physics test because of all the word problems for math. But I, I scored, and I just missed it by a couple of points, uh, primarily because my English was so good uh, that I missed it by qualifying for SEAL training by a couple of points. And so, of course, I always make the joke, right, I was dumber uh, for being bad at math or was I dumber for listening to the recruiter when he told me that I'd get the points waived. So I ended up going to boot camp, went to the Navy's boot camp in Great Lakes at the time. You also had Orlando and San Diego. Now it's just Great Lakes, but I showed up there at 18 years old and soon was disabused of the notion that I would be going to SEAL training and after uh, I went to my follow-on service school in Philadelphia to be basically a Navy plumber, a whole maintenance technician, I ended up working on submarines in Groton, Connecticut. And I was up there and discouraged because, you know, when you're younger, two years seems like a long time. Now as we're, you know, I'm approaching 50 years old, it's, it's nothing. It happens in a blink of an eye. But back then, I'm like, two years, man. And that just, it, it was very disappointing, very discouraging but I still stayed committed, and, and fortunately for me, I, I fell in with a guy that was a former SEAL. He was a photographer's mate. You know, he basically took uh, the photographs for the command, for the sub uh, support facility command up there in Connecticut, and he was a former SEAL who had actually just left the SEAL team so he could be closer to his family in New England, and he, but he took it upon himself to train me and a bunch of uh, other guys that wanted to go to SEAL training. And so we, we worked out. We got stronger. I matured. And so it's, I think it, it actually benefited. It was the right, I think, it was fortunate that that was the path that I took because I think I was probably not quite prepared right out of high school to, to maybe meet the, the rigors of that program. That mentality to just kind of embrace where you're at, continue looking forward, making plans. I mean, a lot of us uh, need that time in the trenches before going on and taking the main stage of, of what our ultimate goal is, because either we need some maturing, we need some additional experience. Uh, 
and obviously like you were getting ready for buds throughout the nineties. And, and once you finally made the team, uh, I think it was what 96, 97 is when you finally made the teams. That's right. I graduated buds and then subsequently showed up to seal team two in 1996. So 1996, I mean, if we're going to paint a picture in, in the 90s, it wasn't a heavy conflict, but it was still high operations for a lot of special operation forces. Uh, would you mind talking a little bit about like what life on the teams was like in the 90s? Yeah, sure. It, it's, you know, it's on the, on the tail end of, of the Gulf War. You still had a couple of Vietnam vets, that, the senior enlisted leaders that were still around, some of the senior officers. It was very much training. It was always kind of the mindset that, hey, there's you never know. This might be the deployment that something happens. And during that period of time, well, on the East Coast, there was primarily at least the teams that I was associated with. It was the focus on the Middle East, the focus on focus on Africa, and then a couple of years later, it would be well, actually during that time as well, it would be like Bosnia Herzegovina. So the the war in the the Balkans, the peacekeeping mission in the Balkans, and a lot of what we did was training. And so in the SEAL teams, you know, we're the maritime component of naval special warfare. So we still have to do the most basic of training that keeps us connected to that maritime environment which requires a lot of the amphibious warfare, going over the beach, which is a lot more complex than it sa sounds, uh, operating from the waterline, doing the combat diving operations, as well as, you know, because the acronym stands for Sea, Air, Land. So it's still a lot of air operations. It's land warfare. We're very much focused on close quarter combat. Primarily during that time, close quarter combat, meaning clearing rooms, primarily focused on VBSS mission, which was a visit board search and seizure, which is basically like close quarter combat to assault ships. So that was the big mission there as well. And then as we got ready to deploy, my first deployment was to Europe. And so we would split half the time. Some of the half the guys would go down to do the Bosnia mission, which was kind of in support of, you know, hunting some more criminals from the Balkans war. And Meanwhile, those that were back were doing what we call J sets, which are basically partner operations with our foreign, you know, our partner special operations forces all over Europe. So anywhere from, for me, I think it, we even went to Eastern Europe. We did uh, jump trips with the um, the Danes, uh, worked with the Germans, the, the the Brits, all that kind of stuff, exercises. But we were also on the hook, as we say, to deal with things that would be unraveling in Africa. And a lot of those cases, it was, you know, years prior, they had uh, basically had to evacuate the U.S. Embassy in Liberia. So that's one of our core taskings is non-combatant evacuation operations. And so we're very much geared towards that, being ready to jump boats into Africa for our coastal embassies and evacuating people. That was a big focus point there. Wow. Without a large full-scale war with, with the public support behind it like we had for OEF, OIF of veterans returning, a lot of your operation sounds like the general public did not know a lot of what you did. So how did you kind of like stay motivated and find purpose in continuing to deploy during those operations? Yeah, I mean, I think probably it has little to do with visibility in the public's eye. We just love to do the mission. And so, you know, I always liken it to a firefighter. You know, a firefighter doesn't want to go their whole career, most of them, without having ha ever having a chance to respond to an actual call. You know, and it's, you know, it's not politically correct to say that you, you know, you, you want to go to war, but I mean, that's the, that's the truth. We, we do all this training, but we want to get tested. And so for us, we're clamoring for any mission, anything that's somewhat real world, as we would say. And so the, the deployment I had right after that was 99, 2000, and in that case, we were doing what we called the Mio surge. We're essentially we were boarding ships that were breaking the the embargo, the blockade on, on Iraq at the time. And so, one of the higher profile operations that we had during the time was we basically took down. We boarded a Russian oil tanker that was smuggling oil from Iraq, and we basically took that thing over. And that kind of had those. Very, it was a very sensitive operation. It was very high visibility at the time, at least within the military in that part of the world. And so it was kind of cool, even though it wasn't in and of itself, it wasn't very, it was kind of anticlimactic, but it was just nice to be able to do something, right? Because then a lot of us are thinking, man, we're never going to get a chance to do anything real. 
And then the next deployment after that, it was Kosovo. So guys were doing that mission, which uh, very reconnaissance heavy. And which, again, one of our core taskings, that's one of the things that we trained really heavily in the late 90s, early 2000s, was what we call RNS, Reconnaissance and Surveillance. So we, we did a lot of that. There's a lot of focus on that as well. Wow, that sounds absolutely incredible to, to keep the motivation up, keep the training going, and then also have that mindset of our, of our Navy Corps values of honor, courage, and commitment that we're defending uh, America's interest foreign or domestic and abroad. So thank you for keeping that motivation and going because in the early 2000s, we needed operators such as yourself as we went into CQC in, in close quarter combat in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. How did your life end up shifting when we finally got the notification that America's forces are going to a large scale war? Yeah, I, I mean, I was essentially like, uh, my SEAL platoon was deployed overseas in Germany during 9-11, but I had gotten injured in a jump in a training exercise in Scotland, and so I had to have surgery, and I actually came home, and I'm sitting there kind of rehabbing after 9-11 happens. Uh, the guys that were over there, they didn't get involved. It was going to be a couple more months before, I think, the, or, or at least a, a, probably about a month and a half, two months before uh, regular SEAL teams were over there in, in Afghanistan. And so I, I had orders to go to a special mission unit, at that time, which uh, I actually had to cancel my orders because of the injury. And, and so I found myself in a training detachment, which is where I was scheduled to go before I went on to that selection process. But I was there at the training detachment while all this was happening and while nine or while we invaded Iraq. And then it really wasn't until 2004 that I actually went on my first like no kid in combat deployment to Iraq. You know, without getting too much into the operations, because you had such a long career of operational and training, um, was there anything about those deployments that that kind of motivated you to continue pushing forward? Because, I mean, you ended up serving another 17 years or, or 15 years after the conflicts kicked off. Yeah, I remember I'm bad at math, so don't test me on the <laughs> dates. But no, uh yeah, I mean, it's just a thing. It's uh, it's kind of cliche now, but it's, you know, the SEAL teams, we refer to it as a brotherhood. And so it's a tribe, right? When I went through SEAL training in 95, I started in 95, and I remember looking around and, and all the reasons that I wanted to be there, right? You know, commando stuff, painting my face green. I realized that, you know, that really wasn't cool enough to actually keep me in training because of all the pain and the suffering, it really is about the connections. It's looking around and saying, you know what? I feel like I found a family here. This is a place. These are people I want to spend my time with. And I really kept saying that to myself. And I said, I'm going to keep doing this while I still am having fun, while I still feel like being a part of this community, you know, whether that's at war or whether that's, you know, non-combat operations. And so my, you know, my entire career was filled with, you know, things that I loved. It's filled with a lot of disappointments too. A lot of times where you're like, man, it's, it's the thing about the SEAL teams is there's times when you're like, oh my God, they're letting us do this. I can't believe we're doing this. And then there's other times you're like, oh man, I can't believe I'm still stuck here doing this. Right. So you're fixed with uh, a number of different highs and lows. And so my career, my career was no different. Right on. Well, you know, contrary to what many people do believe, the military wants our service members to perform well professionally at all times, as well as our personal lives. It's not just about serving in the military, but it's being able to take care of the home life. And they prepare us, or they try to prepare us as best as they can for the the, the general service member. And you were one of three specialists that worked on developing a program towards the end of your career to help sailors develop these necessary tools that would that would uh, help them develop a, a type of toughness called the Warrior Toughness Program. Would, would you be able to kind of talk our listeners through what this program is and what uh, you guys were studying and began teaching? Yeah, sure. I I'll make this as succinct as possible. I was at the Navy's boot camp finishing up my career. It's probably 20... I I'm trying to get the date right. It's either the end of 2016 or early 2017. And uh, essentially, myself a clinical psychologist, a Navy psychologist, and a Navy chaplain were approached by an admiral who basically said, I need you three to figure out 
how to get our sailors tougher. Because we may, in the next several years, be going to war against peer near peer competitors such as the Russians, the Chinese, and our sailors do not have that warrior mindset right now. You know, you think back to 1942 fighting the Empire of Japan in the Pacific. Well, you, you know, a lot of sailors are recruited in the 90s because they're like, hey, you got to be smarter. Join the smarter service. Don't join the service where you're out there, you know, as a grunt in the dirt. Well, the problem with that is you don't see yourself as a warrior, as a war fighter. You know, there's lip service paid to it, but we don't really train that way, right? We're the Army, the Marine Corps, you know, they're doing combatives in their boot camp. Well, we're not. And so a lot of our sailors are just like, hey, it's money for college. I get to go out there. I'll do a job, you know, but we realize, hey, we need to get our sailors because there were things that happened. The missiles being fired at ships. There was collisions at sea where a lot of sailors were not embodying that warrior mindset and so you cannot have uh you know a large portion of your fighting force on a vessel non-combat non-operational because they're shut down because of fear and so we created a program based on performance psychology character development and my contribution was essentially creating the framework for that and the framework i created i dubbed the warrior mindset and that was really based upon how we plan, prepare, execute, and learn in a continuous cycle from our combat operations, how we do all that in the SEAL teams. And so that framework served to kind of onboard the different modalities and training curriculum that we use, such as, you know, the chaplains, they were heavy into the, the character development piece. So a lot of things like uh, the Stoics, the Stoicism, capital S from the Greeks, the Romans, like you think Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, uh, performance psychology was the domain of the, uh, of, the perform of the psychologist. So it's, it's mindfulness training, it's sports psychology, things like that. And then, of course, some of the things that I would take that and use examples of real-world combat uh, operations and high-risk training scenarios to kind of show how it really, you know, the extreme example is military special operations and combat, but really you got to be able to translate that to day in, day out life performance under pressure and just being able to take a hit in combat, but in your personal life and, you know, just get back, get back on the horse, get back in the fight. And so that's really in a nutshell what the program was about. And then we took that program and we actually were very, we were very detailed about how we measured it. We put it through study and control groups, demonstrated that it was effective and as I was getting out of the Navy in 2019, we were expanding it to the rest of the Navy. And the program is still continuing to grow today. It's a great program when I go online and, and when I learned about it, went online and checked it out. I love the stuff that it was teaching because it's it's stuff that, you know, we, we may have experienced some version of training at, of, uh, of it early in our careers. A lot of online learning uh, is what the Navy pushes, you know, the NKO courses back when I was uh, serving. I don't know what they're doing now. Um, and it kind of just like washes through. But a lot of the stuff that uh, I was reading about this warrior toughness program is kind of that practical application within your own team, your own work center to say, hey, these are things that we can do like um, like stopping and taking a breath uh, to recenter yourself when you're about to, uh, you know, be the lead nozzleman on a fire, uh, fire, uh, fire team heading into a, a space that um, that damage control has called general quarters to, um, and I and I've really loved that. It doesn't just apply there, but it applies on like going to trips to the grocery store where you may be dealing with large crowds of people, kind of lost in their own world, slamming carts. I mean. Anybody that's in the military going to the commissary is is like its own battle zone. Um, <laughs> you never know who you're going to interact with. Uh, and you got to be able to just kind of center yourself and say, all right, I'm here on a mission to pick up some chips for the barbecue so I can get back for the game on Sunday. Uh, like, that's all I'm here to do and still like maintaining that composure. And from what I've seen is that you've kind of taken this warrior toughness training and you began teaching it to the civilian uh, people after... Uh, after you got out. So what led to that decision of, of getting out after 27 years and then bringing this to uh, civilians? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. I, I think I was no different than probably the lion's share of, of folks that are transitioning from the military in that, you know, you don't have 
a lot of us struggle to figure out what our next chapter is going to be. Some people that are younger, you know, like a lot of people that come out at, at, the, at the more junior ages, they're, they're like, hey, I'm just going to enlist in the SEAL teams. They're like, hey, I'm going to go get my MBA, get my degree, get my MBA, and then I'm going to go be a consultant. I'm going to be to work in finance. But when you're older like me, it's kind of like, hey, you know, you got a family. It's it, That's not quite your trajectory anymore. And so for me, it was really a matter of looking back on my career and saying, okay, well, what do you think was the biggest benefit? How did you kind of, what kind of legacy did you leave in terms of like, how are you really, what was your biggest impact, right? That's what I'm trying to say. Your biggest impact combined with, well, how can you make money to support your family and what do you actually really enjoy doing? And I, when I look back, I was like, Hey, I spent a lot of time teaching. I love my time in combat, but, uh, that's not really going to be a thing for me when I got out of the military. So I, I think my biggest impact was, was training, was training, uh, U S military special operations, foreign special operations forces. And of course the warrior toughness program. And so I looked at that and I said, you know, there's a lot of things we all need to perform under pressure. We all need to manage stress and if we are not careful, if we're not deliberate, we're going to bring that stress home and it's going to negatively impact our relationships domestically, right, in our homes. And so how can we? I create a program that can give people the tools that they need, right? It's not life or death. People aren't being shot. But for you, in your moment, you know, it might as well be because this important moment is your, is your job, it's your relationship, it's your credibility on the line, your reputation. So yeah, you, you need to leverage all the skills to show up as your best self. And so that's what I like to help with. You know, and you kind of had to put these skills together because not only did you get out after a 27 year career, this is what you knew right out of high school. Uh, and you were starting something new. You were starting a program where, where you're teaching, you're writing, you're going in and, and speaking to organizations. And unfortunately, at the start of it all, we ran into the 2020 COVID pandemic, which shut everything down, including in-person co coaching services. I mean, even our own business, uh, we were filming weddings at the time was the majority of our revenue. And we had to cancel contracts, send back money or postpone things for two to three years down the road that were already paid for. And we weren't going to be able to bring in any more money in from those. So how did you end up pivoting and finding a way to move forward and, and maintain that motivation? Yeah, no, and that's, that's a, it's an important question. And I will try to avoid going down a rabbit hole with this. But, you know, I, one of the things that I teach is I, I think the fundamental thing that I try to solve is I want people to look ahead and identify important moments in their life, personally, professionally, important situations, uh, triggers, stressors. And instead of reacting to instead respond, meaning you're more deliberate, you're more intentional, and you've put some forethought. Now, that being said, it, it's not realistic for us to be able to not only anticipate, but really kind of invest time in being ready for everything. I, I, it's just not realistic, because if you spread yourself too thin, then you're not going to be effective in any one area. And so I can look back and say that when I created my, you know, I launched my speaking business in 2019, literally like a couple months before COVID hit, you know, I can look back and say, hey, I should have been able to pivot just like my friends and peers that have been speaking for a while. Because a lot of them who have been speaking also had to do speaking events virtually. Because, you know, sometimes that just, hey, we're not going to bring in people. Can you do this over Zoom or whatever? And so they were poised to do that. I was not. Now, I can easily say, well, I should have been able to pivot. Well, the reality is, is I didn't and I wasn't. But what's important here is that even if we can't respond with certain skills in terms of preparation, I think what helped me was that I was able to sit back. And because of warrior toughness, because of the things that I learned about stoicism, one of the things that stoicism it gets you to appreciate is that every moment, every event, every situation, it's not necessarily whether it's good or bad, no matter what it is, it affords you an opportunity. So see every moment, every situation as that, as an opportunity, right? If you're sick, you know, if you're if you're struggling, it's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity to, to lean into relationships. It's an opportunity to demonstrate grace. Maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe it is business success and reaching your goals. But everything is an opportunity. And that opportunity for me was to be able to enjoy the time with my family. And the opportunity to, even if I'm not getting paid for it, to somehow provide value to another organization, another person. And that's that. that's what I did. 
Well, I'll, I'll tell you, it seems like your program adds so much value to the lives of your readers, your students, and even the service members that, that you had an opportunity to impact. And your current message teaches individuals, teams, and corporations how to meet any challenge and opportunity that's set before them. In, in your book, Life on the X, what are some of the key concepts that you, you try to teach uh, people and what do you hope people take away from the book? For sure. And I think the framework that I mentioned earlier, the framework I created, I basically used that to introduce the various forms of content. And the framework is simply this. If you vision a, a basically a circle connected, all, it's, a, it's a circle, it's a reflective cycle is, is what I call it because you're always somewhere within this continuum. And it starts with commit, then it goes to prepare, execute, and then reflect. Commit is really the character piece is again, looking ahead and identifying your challenges, your opportunities, your stressors, and really saying to yourself, okay, no matter what, I'm willing to be the type of person that is going to commit to being intentional and deliberate to being ready for those moments. And so I often am big into preaching, understanding your values, your beliefs, and distilling them down into principles. And that's how you show up every day. That's your brand, and that's how you're seen by others. Now, when we get into the prepare piece, that's twofold. One, it's one of the things that I that really a lot of people connect with is this this principle of being brilliant at the basics, and that really is is looking and saying, hey, rather than getting distracted by all the shiny things, all the different technologies and methodologies, just be really good at the very basic fundamental elements and aspects of your craft, which means developing habits, routines rhythms and making sure that when the the very most basic things are tied up what you'll find is it's going to be less distraction it's going to be less mental weight that you have and instead it's going to allow your focus and attention to be on the things that really matter especially in a high stakes moment the things that really move the needle that's engaged with a client that's dealing with a chaotic situation now, when we get into the next piece which of, of prepare, it's about being using performance psychology that professional athletes use, right? Being able to give the right kind of self-talk, the right focus, being able to regulate your emotions and sharpen your focus in the face of distractions. And part of the ways we do that is for some mindfulness training that I, that I talk about. When we get into execute, it's taking all those things and culminating them into actually getting ready to walk out onto your X, your big moment, but maintaining that poise, that agility, that flexibility. And then lastly, when it comes to the reflect piece, what we do in the military, we do really well, especially in aviation and special operations community, is our lessons learned. Now, in, in the military or in the business world, it's, it's hard because we're always focused on output and production. But if we can be brilliant at the basics in creating frameworks and checklists and processes and habits and routines there too, then we can very efficiently and quickly gather the lessons learned and really be able to distill them down into future steps for improvement, constant process improvement and action steps. So that's it in a nutshell. And my book's about that. And it's examples for you in your professional life, but also in your personal life as well. Well, I don't want you to give away your entire course too much during this podcast or, or anything like that. But I'll tell you, when I read through it, I, I had a few um, few reflective questions that I was grateful I'm getting a chance to ask the author of. Uh, <laughs> so when we're talking about that military transition, uh, a lot of people focus on finding purpose, uh, especially within their professional life. Like you had mentioned, a lot of a lot of people, they're just like, oh, I'm going to get an MBA. I'm going to get into business. I'm going to get into sales. Uh, I'm going to find the next job to kind of take care of whatever problem. And within today's generation, at least we have... Um, we have a lot of people jumping from job to job to job, just trying to find out that one thing that they want to do. So how would you go about suggesting, because I feel like once somebody finds their purpose uh, within working a specific job, even if it is something like restocking shelves, if they can find that they have a purpose in doing this similar monotonous job, that they'll be able to start kind of sticking with the goals that they're setting and start to see really exponential results down the road. So how would you go about suggesting somebody identify and find their own purpose? 
Yeah. You know, the thing when you talk about finding purpose, right? People often, you know, you're thinking about the meme, this very poetic, find your purpose, pursue what you love. And, and that's, that's all great. But I got I to gotta say, it doesn't necessarily always reflect reality because especially as somebody who's maybe been around the, the earth for a little bit of time, you got to juxtapose that purpose in, in your professional pursuits against the backdrop of your personal realities in your personal life, your kids, right? Your, your family, maybe your, your, your spouse, they also have a career. And so you take that into consideration. You take into consideration what job you're going to be able to get that's going to provide you the necessary income to maintain your standard of living, to maintain goals for the future. And then you combine that with, well, what do you like to do? What do you want to do? Right. And sometimes to your point, you got to do a few jobs after you get out of the military to find that. Now, you hopefully find your dream job and that's great, but okay. But what if not? What if you don't? Well, then it's sometimes it's on us. Like we got to take that ownership to say, you know what? I'm going to bring purpose to the work that I do and I'm going to help instill. I'm going to help validate purpose in other people because then that's going to make me happier. That's going to make me more content. So take some ownership of the environment that you're creating wherever you go. And sometimes, you know, even in the perfect job, you're not always going to love your boss. You're not going to love your project. You're not always going to love the direction the organization goes, right? So take some ownership and say at the end of the day, as this cliche is, uh, you know, as other people have said, I didn't quote this, but it's not always about what you do. It's who you get to do it with. So at the end of the day, you can do a crappy job, but if you're surrounded by great people, you know, you can find purpose in that as well. I absolutely love that. And that starts to kind of bleed into the next aspect and you, and you were touching on it is the relationships that we have, whether it's a coworker, a boss, a family member, our, our spouse or our child. Uh, one of the things that I love that you mentioned uh, is when we are preparing for anything that we do, we're meeting new people, whenever we're, we're about to embark upon something, we need to find a way to add value to those that we encounter. Uh, a, a lot of the times it's, what can I get out of this? What can I, what can I, I'm going to become friends with this person because of their status versus, hey, I'm going to bring my own level of contribution to the relationship. And so I'd love to kind of hear what your viewpoint on uh, how do we add value to a relationship and why is that important? Well, I mean, I, I'll say this, it's, it's absolutely right. You're not looking, you, you don't, go to add value it, it, just for some tangible thing that you're going to get. You're going to manipulate a relationship to get something tangible out of that. That said, it doesn't mean that adding value is completely selfless. It's not, right? Because when you add value, you're demonstrating that you have value in yourself. You're bringing value to a situation where you can't do that if you offer no value, right? So when you're leading with value, it's going to end up coming back on you somehow, Right. And this is huge with you. And I learned this from some of the people really, you know, sales professionals and, and sales leadership, chief commercial operators, head of VP of sales. A lot of them would say, hey, are my best sales reps? And I learned this from my wife, too, who's in pharmaceutical sales. The, the best sales reps are those that lead with value. They show up and they are they are perfectly willing to say the product or offering that I am bringing to the table may not be the right fit for you. But I know somebody, I know something that can be a fit for you. So you're still, even if you're not selling your product, you're seen as somebody that adds value. And eventually that is going to come back on you somehow. Not to mention just any opportunity that you can show up and do something for someone. You can positively impact somebody's life. You know, there's a lot of value in that for yourself. You know, when you can have the power to make somebody's day better. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's just me, but I think there's enormous value in that. One of the things that my my father taught me and other other people throughout my life had taught me um, was when I was a teenager, my, my dad used to volunteer for uh, the church that he attended. And so on Saturdays, uh, the church would hold events, Sundays, Wednesdays, uh, whatever throughout the week, and he would go there and he would just set up the tables. 
He would go unlock the space, set up the tables, and greet the people that were hosting the event. He didn't go and and uh, was was the most uh, social person at these things because he was there to set up and break down, and that was the value that he brought to a community. Um, and like I've I've seen the fruit that he's experienced in his life just by showing up and doing something as simple as opening a door. That's right, and that's one of the things that that I that I like to do. And again, it's not for selfless reasons, right? I like to, I always, you know, try to peel off time out of my year to do what what my main job is, right? Is delivering keynote speeches and workshops. And I always try to, to set aside time to do those for people that normally wouldn't, you know, have access to that. And again, because I get a lot of satisfaction with trying to add value to a situation, to an audience that might not otherwise be exposed or have access to the things that I that I can bring. You know, one of the things that you do so brilliantly that a lot of high performing professionals, whether it's in special operations, athletics, uh, musicians, whatever it is, is that you have the ability to focus so simply on the basics. And one of the adages that I loved learning uh, when I served with the Marines, when we would practice uh, taking apart and putting together our weapons, the disnas of of uh, of the whole rifle uh, was. You know, you try to do it as fast as you can, and it usually means that you're like finger jamming things, and things are getting stuck, and it's just not—it's um, not working, and it ends up slowing you down. And so, somebody had once taught me, uh, "Slow is smooth, and smooth is fast." And they were just talking about like this basic of push this button, release this lever, and then just let the object happen, and do these do these basic movements over and over and over again, and you will reap massive rewards because the speed will improve, the efficiency in which we do our movements will improve. And so how do you still apply doing the basics uh, in, in your life and applying like the slowest, smooth, smoothest, fast? Yeah, and, and I, I don't know how much I directly correlate because I've always kind of just as the, the scenario you described in terms of... Uh, Assembling, disassembling weapons to be for speed. It's the same thing we train small arms, marksmen, or tactical shooting, I should say, which is uh, accurate shooting, but doing it uh, dynamically on the move, doing it for speed. And we were always taught on the range, be machine-like, right? Which means to be very consistent with your movements. And then if you slow that down and you're machine-like, it means that you're very deliberate, that you do the same movement every time that you do a reload, every time that you clear a malfunction in your weapon system, right? It's machine-like. It's the same way every time. And then what you find is not only are you able to speed up, but you're able to have your mind more in the moment. This is a very difficult concept for people to understand, is I want to be mindful in a situation, meaning like you run across the room, you don't think left, right, left, right, right? You're not thinking about the steps that you take, right? If you're playing basketball or something, you're not thinking. You're, you're, think, you're already in a flow state. You're instead, you're reading, hopefully, the game. You're reading kind of where the opponents are, where, where your, your teammates are. Well, it's the same thing in anything you do. The more mechanical and, and streamlined you can be in your very basic things, then the more attention and focus you have on the moment. And so I think... I try to apply that concept very broadly in the sense that, hey, I find myself often going down different rabbit holes, right? It's like, hey, well, all right, you're not on this. You, you see like in the Facebook groups that I'm in for speaking, a new piece of technology, a new kind of, you know, different website that helps you do this for your business. And it's like, man, I could just be spinning on that all day long. Okay, let me get back to the basics. Let me make sure that I'm executing a very clean speech that's customized, that's very custom tailored and de de delivered at a very high level to the audience. And then when I've got that dialed in, when I'm doing the very basic social media posts that I need to do, when I've got those rhythms established and maintained, then I can start looking at doing new things. Now, I feel like, you know, I can start to feel when I'm out of whack uh, and, and I'm not doing the basics of how I run my day. Uh, I usually set, try to set it off with a pretty steady rhythm before I jump into all of the more difficult work that I have to do. And that usually means that if I don't do that, I'm a bit more irritable. I may snap at something a little bit smaller or, or have a snarky response uh, to my wife and, and business partner in, in all of this, which is very uncharacteristic of who 
uh, I try to be and, and who a lot of people see me as, um, you know, and a lot of us, uh, that have experienced kind of intense, uh, trauma or, you know, intense training from the military, if we're not focusing on the basics of living and we're constantly like living in this space of heightened awareness and hyper alertness, we can start to really start to shape our lives and respond in a way that we did when we were in the military. So like when we're with our family, we might be shorter with them. We might expect them to respond the way a teammate would respond or, or, or a, a fellow service member would respond. And when they don't respond in kind, I know for me, like I've, I've yelled or I've broken down or, you know, I've, I've gone off at the pharmacy, uh, at, at the pharmacist at the counter because they didn't have my prescription when they said they would have my prescription ready. But I usually don't recognize that. It's usually people outside of me that recognize that I'm being shorter, that I'm stumbling over my words or that I can't, um, I can't wrap my head around a problem that would normally come easy. And so my wife, my close friends provide me with necessary feedback. I know in, in part of your book, you, you talk about a similar experience with your wife and kids out in a yard, and you had to receive feedback from a loved one. How would you suggest that people give that feedback? And then how would you go about receiving the feedback? First of all, I think it's important to say, you know, you have what you want to be. And I always tell this when I, whenever I, I speak and I talk about the need to create a mission statement. And, and I'm very declarative in that statement, and that meaning I, I am this, I do that. It's not I hope, I wish, I want, right? It's I do these things, I am those things. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't fall short, right? Doesn't mean that you don't stray from the path, right? And I still struggle, as I'm sure you do. It doesn't mean that I have to be a product of those mistakes. That doesn't mean those those mistakes are who I am. Right? But a certain thing happens in order for me to continue to move on, in order for me to kind of be authentic, it means that I do have to hold myself accountable, but I also have to forgive myself. And, and I think it's easy to get frustrated for everyone, right? And, and it's easy for a loved one to confront you, right? When it's, and that may be justified. They may be justified in, in confronting your bad behavior doesn't always mean it's going to be productive. Could be warranted, could be justified, but I think it's, you got to have these conversations offline. You know, for me, it's, you know, if I'm the one who, who needs to be better, I got to have a conversation that says, Hey, I, I, I know I screw up. I'm sorry. Uh, I need to be held. You, you know, I need to hold myself accountable and I will hold myself accountable. Can can you help me with this, right? It's not like, hey, I'm not responsible. Uh, you know, I, I'm a victim. No, it's simply like, hey, I need your help. Can you help me do better, right? And I think people are often open to that, right? And I think if you're on the other side of that and, and you want to help that person and maybe you don't know whether they're open to it, again, it's always when there's calm, when it's a, a nice, good conversation, then you can kind of broach that subject and say, hey, you know, because every human, we all have areas in our life where we want to improve. To ask that question, hey, I noticed that this happens. How, how are you feeling? You must, you must be struggling a little bit to having, having empathy to that person. But also kind of saying, hey, I'm going to lovingly hold you accountable to be the person that I know you really want to be if, if, if you can. So it's difficult and it's really very dependent. Uh, at the end of the day, it's very individualized. So it's hard to offer a, uh, a prescription for, for one size fits all, right? Absolutely. We, we all are made slightly differently. Our interactions, our experiences shape who we are, and we don't all have the same experiences. Even being in the same firefight with, with some of the men that I was in firefights alongside, we have a different recollection of what occurred. We have a different takeaway from, from those experience, experiences. And many of our service members, despite their training, despite what they've known, uh, and despite people being there to try to come alongside them and help them still struggle. And unfortunately, for too many of us, it ends in death by suicide. Do you have any words of hope for somebody that's currently struggling? You know, that's a tough one as well. And I'll start off by saying this. There's many of us, many people out there who are experienced significant trauma 
experiencing very difficult mental health issues. And for those events, there needs to be equally serious interventions, sometimes medication, sometimes other treatments. But that being said, like that also, it's also true that we need to each one of us ask ourselves the hard questions. And a lot of those questions are, am I still being disciplined? I trained as a warrior in the military. Am I still bringing that same amount of discipline to my life? Or have I kind of let that atrophy? Have I kind of maybe allowed certain excuses to take hold? Because at the end of the day, that's not helping us. And so what I would say is we got to ask ourselves in the discipline in our area, all the different things. First, are we getting the type of sleep that we need to get, right? We don't control elements of that. What do we control about the elements of our sleep? We control sleep hygiene. We control our, our alcohol consumption around bedtime, right? We can control the going to bed the same time, waking up the same time. Those things we control. Sleep is a huge thing. Okay, well, what about, are we self-medicating? Okay, because if we are, then we need help with that. We should really look at, for a lot of us, our alcohol consumption. Are we training? Are we training our body? Are we doing strength training like we should be doing, right? Are we training our minds? And so are we doing... Uh, mindfulness exercises to strengthen our brains the same way we do our body. And we got to ask ourselves, if we're not doing those things, why? Because if we're looking for the magic bullet, we need to get in line the certain things that we absolutely do control. We need to attack those things first. I love it. And, and again, it sounds very much like going back to the basics of what we need to do to take care of ourselves so that we can establish that baseline and, You've literally written the book on overcoming some challenges, uh, especially just by establishing that baseline of the basics and knowing where you need to look. Where can our listeners find more information from you, about you, and even connect with your programs? Yeah, for sure. You can hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram. That's mostly where I play. Uh, also, you can check out my website, stephendrum.com, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-D-R-U-M.com. And also, I work with uh, the chief learning officer at, for an app called Mental. It's a getmental.com. And one of the things that I do is I coach uh, what's called a cold shower protocol. So using the stress of cold water and training some of the things that I talk about, mindfulness, mindset training, mental skills, under the shock of cold wet, cold water, just like we train in the military. You, you learn the basic skills. Well, you got to be tested in stressful scenarios to know that you can apply them in combat. And so that's what that app is. But it's just a cool thing. It's mostly geared towards men, but a lot of women are into it too. Uh, but it's, it's hey, we're taking a serious topic such as men's mental health without taking ourselves too seriously. So we have a lot of fun there too. So I, I, I highly encourage people to check that out, getmental.com. Awesome. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. I really appreciated our conversation and I really appreciate you coming on the One Mile, One Veteran podcast. Hey, it's truly my pleasure. And thanks so much for having me, Danny. Thank you for tuning in to Stephen's story during your walk today. Remember to log your activity in, Str in the Strava app and join our virtual walking group, One Mile, One Veteran, for daily motivation to stay active.